Thank you, Pam, and again, congratulations to this year's winners. It is now my honor to introduce our keynote for today, Mr. Ken Shelton. As an educational technology specialist, a Google certified teacher, Apple distinguished educator, and Discovery Star educator, Ken has spent over 14 years as an educator and most recently taught technology at the middle school level. Currently, he presents nationally and internationally, offering keynotes, presentations, and hands-on workshops covering a wide variety of topics, including educational technology, technology integration, creative expression, photography, visual learning, visual storytelling, and instructional design. Ken was also named to the California State Superintendent of Public Instruction's Educational Technology Task Force. In addition to the effective use of digital resources, he is passionate about travel, food, and photography. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Ken Shelton. Thank you. All right. Good morning, everybody. So while I get set up, I will say that this is actually the first time that I've spoken at a conference in which the weather has been a major factor. So I apologize for not bringing the sun from, with me from uh, California. And as I get set up, I will share one other thing. So I have a number of goals for this uh, particular keynote. And the main thing that I'm going to uh, request uh, of all of you is that um, you use this time with me to uh, let go of yourself a little bit. And you'll see what I mean by that as I work my way through the keynote, and I will be doing the exact same thing. Um, I call this keynote the art of iteration, uh, embracing failure for learning because of the following. Number one, um, iteration is, is used kind of loosely. The actual definition of iteration is to repeat something. But what I would like for us to do is use it in context for learning because in many cases, uh, we look at certain things that we do, especially learning endeavors, that um, they essentially can become hurdles for us. Uh, and I will share some personal stories with all of you about what it was like for me both in the classroom as a student and then how I was as, as a teacher. So the first thing is I have a back channel set up for us here at today's meet. Um, this, if, if, if I will kindly request that you all not post this link on Twitter. And here's the reason why. In the latter part of my career as a teacher in the classroom, I had an epiphany, which I'll share with all of you uh, a little bit later in the keynote. And one of the things was that if I knew that students truly believed, understood, and trusted me to know that when they set foot into what I called our learning environment, I never called it my classroom, if they felt comfortable and trusted me, then it meant that they were no longer, they no longer had the hurdles of expression, of vulnerability, of risk, of things like that. And so part of the reason why I'm asking all of you not to put this on Twitter is because I would like for that to serve as our space. It will be up for a week, you can download the PDF, but I know that a lot of times uh, we don't do things or we are hesitant to do things because of what others will think, okay? So you'll see, again, I, I have examples uh, that I will share with all of you of myself, as well as things that will hopefully inspire you to change your perspective on what it means to, be a, to make mistakes and more importantly, what it means uh, what failure means. So that's the, uh, the URL. Hopefully all of you are able to get to it. I'll give you another moment or so. And I know the Wi-Fi is rock solid, so we should be connected. Okay, so I'm going to start us off with this. And the reason why I start us off with that is because we all use a pencil. Guess what? Pencils have erasers for a reason, because we're expected to make mistakes. And what I want to do is go through and now go through 
what is it to make a mistake? What is it like to make a mistake? And then juxtapose that with a mistake versus a failure. Okay? So in many cases, we make all kinds of mistakes. We probably make mistakes daily. In fact, some of you might have taken a left turn when you should have turned right on your way here. Uh, those are small things. You know, in some cases, mistakes are even things like you mistook, mistook Coke for Pepsi, okay? Or uh, what happens to me a lot of times, I can't find my car keys, okay? But those are just mistakes. And usually what happens when we make a mistake is we get an emotion of anger. Oh, I made a mistake. Not a big deal, we just move on. However, what happens when a mistake, either our perception of it or others' perception of it turns into failure. So what I would like to do is I would like for us to examine and take a closer look at failure. What does it mean to be a failure? What does it mean to fail? And why does it affect us the way that it does? So usually when we experience failure, us as adults now, when we were students, many of our students, we go through a range of emotions. And in many cases, those emotions can be debilitating. They can be inhibitors. The emotions there are things like this. You feel alone. I failed. I'm the only one that did it. My teacher pointed it out. They didn't point it out to anybody else. My parents looked at me only. And what happens when you feel alone after a failure is then you become isolated. Nobody's gonna help me. I'm afraid to ask for help. I don't know what to do next. I'm finished. And then what happens when we feel alone and isolated over and over and over and over and over again? We become what? Shameful. I'm not going to try it anymore. I don't like those feelings. That shame then turns into despair. See where I'm going with this? These are all things that all of us have felt and experienced, and in some cases, recently, okay? And then the ultimate thing that happens, that, that major block that in many cases, a lot of us cannot overcome, a lot of our students cannot overcome, is that despair turns into humiliating. Part of that is because of how we look at failure. How we look at what does it mean to fail? Why does it make me feel alone and isolated? Why am I not willing to take risks? Why am I not putting myself out there because I don't want to feel shameful, despair, I don't want to be humiliated, okay? So what I would like to do at the moment is take about a minute and a half and will you please share with your neighbor and then I'll post a link to a, uh, a Google form. Will you please share with your neighbor Whenever you've experienced failure, what emotions have you felt? What is, the, what is the most prevalent emotion you felt when you experienced failure? And then in turn, what was the circumstance? Okay, please take about a minute and a half, go. So, if you will kindly, please, encapsulate your conversation, uh, and more importantly, what was the most common or, or the first word you use when you, when you associate the emotion you feel with failure? If you will go to this website, uh, which is a Google form, if you'll put that in there, and then I have another spot for you to share maybe a thought or an idea of what it felt to you. 
And remember, I mentioned safe. There's a reason why I'm not asking for your name on there, because this is, again, this is viewable to all of you. How'd you feel? What was the circumstance? Can you all scan it in the back? Okay, hang on, let me try something. Now. And again, you all, once you uh, submit to this form, there should be a link that will allow you to see the other uh, submissions. Uh, there's some comments in here that I think are really uh, important and useful, like prefer to use positive words than repeatedly using the word failure. It happens every day. One of the analogies I used to use with my uh, students was uh, I played college football. And I used to tell them that there's a failure on every single play. Because if everyone were 100% successful on every single play, nothing would ever happen. <laughs> we'll give it about another minute, or 30 seconds, actually. good one right here. What do you feel when you fail? It's not the failure that brings the negative feelings, but the expectation that you should have succeeded and didn't. That one is important, and I will talk about that shortly. All right, so I'm going to capture at this point your words. Let's see what is the most Well, I can go back to it. 
But you all have access to all of these, so um, ultimately, I will put it together and, uh, and post it in our chat. So, I'm going to put myself on the sofa and share with all of you a number of things that have happened to me as a student, as a professional. Okay? So, remember I mentioned earlier about being vulnerable, putting yourself out there? Okay? So, now it's my turn. Number one, when I was in school, I was called anyone and all of the following. A dumb jock, you're just an athlete, you don't know anything. I had plenty of cases in which I turned in work and that was my letter grade. We won't get into the whole thing of how I feel about grades and letter attached to assessment, but I never put myself out there because I was always fearful, and that's another emotion that I experienced. I was always fearful of that, okay? Think about what that does to a child when you, when they accomplish something for work and they get it back and there's this big red letter on there. And then you're told you're a failure, okay? For me, I realized in school that I was not going to get appropriate feedback from the teacher. I had to get it from my parents. Because whenever I got one of these, it was like, okay, well, I'm done. It's over. And you'll see, I'll, I'll mention later why that is a failure in the system as to how we learn and how we teach, okay? I then went to college, so on and so forth, became a teacher. Guess what the first thing I did as a teacher? Exactly the same thing that was done to me. Students would turn in work, you fail. We're done. I had a moment of clarity, probably in my sixth year. That clarity for me was, well, wait a minute. If a student is handing in work, and I mark down that it's an F, and then that's the end, what they learn. When I played football, you did plays over and over and over and over and over. It was not run a play, oh, you messed up, we're done. For me in the classroom, it was, well, wait a minute. I'm making a huge failure for myself and my students in our learning environment. What needed to happen was the only way for a student to learn is for them to get appropriate feedback. And feedback is not a letter grade. Feedback is, I see room for improvement, let's look at it together, and then do it over. That's why I call it the art of iteration. Do it over, continually, it's a process. And you'll see I have a graphic. Learning is process, not product. You learn during the process. The product is where understanding kicks in. And that's my whole thing about the whole Bloom's taxonomy. I think it's totally wrong. I think it's, it should be the other way around. You can synthesize and create before you actually understand. Okay? So for me, that was a point in which I had a moment of clarity with my students in the learning environment that I would no longer give them feedback of which the letter grade was a means to an end. They would get feedback in the sense that, okay, no problem, you've done one thing, now let's continue this process because that's when you are going to learn. And the byproduct of that, which is something I call the advantage of not knowing, had no plans on what ended up happening. What ended up happening is that the students started developing a skill set to evaluate their own work. And so then when they come to me and say, hey, Mr. Shelton, I've completed X project. Have you taken a look at it? Yes. And then over time, over years, this was not an overnight thing. This was over years for me to develop this communicative process with the students. Over years, I noticed more and more and more and more. Students were, one, not afraid to put themselves out there with their work. And you'll see later what I, what I mean by that. Two, the work that was getting turned in to me was significantly better at my first look than it was back 
when I was doing this. Because to me, the most important component of that skill set and even that mindset was, as a student, I would like for you to be able to develop strategies to assess your own work. Because long after you're out of my classroom, that is something that will stand the test of time. Not, I'm just gonna give you a grade and then we're done. And so with that, I have a video to share with you. This is an oldie but a goodie. Um, many of you might have already seen this. Um, and, and the reason why I wanted to use this was two, there's two, two major reasons. One is, in context, I want to preface it by saying, look at the video from the eyes of failure and learning. And then two, the other component is, if you were to do a YouTube search to find examples of students celebrating failure, you probably won't find more than a couple which goes back to the vulnerability aspect. So I, will, I won't play the whole thing, but I will play part of it for you. I'm on your comments, and I made a Rube Goldberg machine. A Rube Goldberg machine is a machine that creates a chain reaction, a really complicated one, to make to do a simple task. Um, so, my Rube Goldberg is going to start with this domino being knocked down. They're going to fall all the way up here, knocking down this bowling pin, creating a shockwave, spinning this gyroscope, running down here, pushing the marker top, laying the mini marble, going down here, around the spiral, down this ramp, and hitting this switch control power socket. Turning on this toaster, when the toaster's done, this lever will pop up, letting a ball fall out, knocking all the balls off, hitting this paper roll, running down here, hitting this paper towel tube, knocking down this wine glass with the fishigi ball on top. The fishigi ball will fall off. And let release the pulley, letting this thing fall on the monster and trapping him. And um, little cobalt machines don't don't always work on on the first try. So this is my chart: how much successes and how much failures. I think I think we'll have. This is my hypothesis, and this is the actual. My hypothesis on successes is two. 19, 20. I think it will have 10 to 20. 10 to 20 failures and two successes. But that's, that's my hypothesis. <laughs> Okay, I'm just going to pause it for a moment for two reasons. One, they don't always work. You know what you say? They don't always work. No big deal. I'm predicting X number of failures, but I'm still going to run the machine anyway. Okay? That's two failures already. Did he stop? No. And what I'll do, just for time's sake, I will go forward to success so you all can see his reaction. So, so the thing I've, I've seen this video a gazillion times, I love it. 
But the, the reason why I wanted to share that, that video during this keynote with all of you is, what would happen if all of our students had that degree of enthusiasm for all of the work that they do? Because they know, okay, well, there's gonna be some failures, but who cares? It's no big deal. And this is on YouTube. Wasn't afraid to post it, thanks to his mom who filmed it. That's the thing about this, and that's the thing that I'm, I, I, my goal in this entire keynote to share is that our perspective on failure has got to change. It is debilitating. I notice a lot of you use the word debilitating, uh, disheartening. Why are we doing that to ourselves? Why are we allowing that to permeate our learning environments? Learning is, uh, failure is important. If you have success all the time, then, which is impossible, but it's, you know, it's, it's a function of looking at, looking at things differently. And I will tell you, see that 26 times? 26 times he's been trusted to make it and missed. Roughly about half. What if I told you you're only going to be successful 50% of the time? Most people say, well, that's not enough. Think about baseball. How many of you watch baseball or like baseball? If you're successful as a hitter 35% of the time for your career, you're a Hall of Famer. 35%. And like I said, another sports analogy, football. Every single play, there is at least several failures. There has to be. So our perspective on it has got to shift a little bit. And so part of that shifting is involving developing what I call as a flexible mindset. Okay? When we try something, when our students do work, when we take on a task, Part of the way we can alter our perspective on what happens when we experience failure is to recognize that in many cases, when we venture to do something, our intended outcome may not be the actual outcome. Think about it from this standpoint. If you do something and you have one expectation of one outcome, and that one outcome doesn't happen, that's when we get into shame, humiliation, despair, okay? What I, what I, one, one of the uh, ways I like to uh, share it is that, you know, when you, I used to even tell my students, this, when you're starting a project, there's a million possibilities. If you allow that one intended outcome that you didn't get to affect you, then you have disregarded the 999,999 other possibilities. Put that in perspective. One versus 999,999. When I kept telling the kids, they're like, oh yeah, I guess it isn't really that big of a deal. No, it isn't. Absolutely not. And so that's where I get into developing a flexible mindset. Okay. And then every time we engage in any, any venture or any learning opportunity, there's always a test associated with it. What happens if that expected outcome doesn't occur? What happens if I don't get what I want? What happens if it doesn't turn out exactly how my teacher wants? Those are all learning opportunities, every single one. And every time we give the students an opportunity to iterate, to take corrective action, to take additional action, to go back and change something, to go back and reassess. That is the learning. Learning, or excuse me, failure is not a means to an end. It is a component of the process. And so, to me, process is far more important than product. Because that's when the learning occurs. Every time you iterate and ideate, every single time, that is a new method of doing something. Every time I would have students work on a project, ah, it's not quite what I wanted, then go back and look at what you did, and at the point in which you made a decision that you ended up where you are now, do something different. 
And in fact, not only do something different, one of the things I used to always encourage the students to do as well, I'm like, do something really crazy that you know none of your classmates will do. And by the way, we're gonna put it online, which I will get into that in just a moment. And so, ultimately what happens is when you go through uh, those process, every time you experience a failure, guess what? That's the best feedback. That's, I tried something and it didn't work, and now I can start, and that, now that's one learning opportunity, and now I get another. Because, guess what? It doesn't always work out the way we want anyway. And those opportunities for feedback, for information, that's real world information. I would always tell the students that. Every time you experience something of which the outcome wasn't what you wanted, that's the best information that you can get, better than me putting a comment on something, better than someone else looking at it. When you can look at it and say, you know what, that's not exactly what I wanted, and go back and make changes, you can't beat that feedback. And if you allow that to inspire you to continue to do things over and over and over and over again, boy, you can't beat that. Not at all. And so I'm going to share a video with you of some, they call them accidental inventions, but each one was a failure that occurred. <laughs> jobs being fired and then coming back okay here's my favorite example Ruth Wakefield worked in a toll house and made chocolate cookies she melt, melt melt baker's chocolate 
mix it in with the dough, make cookies. It was at one time, and all it takes is one, one time, in which she didn't have enough time to melt the chocolate, broke up Nestle semi-sweet chocolate, just threw it in the dough and hoped that in the oven it will melt. It didn't. Thankfully it didn't. Okay? And as a result of that, the founders of Nestle found out about it. She shared her recipe, which is now on the back of Nestle chocolate chip cookies, and that recipe is the Toll House chocolate chip cookie recipe. Okay? I have a failure though. See? Changing our perspective on, on these things. And so I have a quote, this is a quote from a song that I really like, because I really think it's it's poignant with this. And the reason why I share that quote is because this book, if, if I could recommend any book, this is definitely one. It's by Austin Kleon. He wrote uh, Steal Like an Artist. This is my favorite one. Show your work. I didn't even know that that concept existed when I was in the classroom, but yet my main thing with students was I want accessibility, visibility, and vulnerability. Only way to be vulnerable is to show your work. So for me, in the classroom, students had to publish all of their work. All of it. Digital portfolio, class blog. Anything you produce in our learning environment must be published. Two major reasons. One, it is amazing at how the work changes when you have the following conditions. One, you're not going to get an F. You're going to get feedback for iteration. And two, you are producing work for more than an audience of one. which in turn creates an environment of perfect. I can put it out there. I'm not worried about the letter associated with the quality of my work. And then the other component to it with the students was I wanted them to understand what it means to take a punch. So let me share with all of you on that. When a fighter is training, it's called sparring. You get in the ring, they're sparring. They have a sparring partner. Guess what they're doing? They're not sitting there hitting a bag. They're, they're punching another human being who's also punching them. What happens the more you spar, you get hit. You get hit again, and again, and again, and again. And eventually, what happens? You get hit so much that you can now take a punch. Which means that when it comes time for that prize fight, that's really important, and you get punched, it affects you a whole lot less. That same principle was what I wanted in the learning environment with my students. Make your thinking visible, show your work, and learn how to take a punch. Because once you can take a punch, you are no longer fearful of being vulnerable. And by showing your work, you're putting yourself out there, which means that now all of us are sharing in that learning. I now know what your stories are. I now know what your product is. I now know the process of which you went through multiple iterations of something so that I can, I can visibly see what your learning was along the way. And more importantly, so can your classmates. And then more importantly, everyone will do that. And then the byproduct of that, the advantage of not knowing, is that now we have an environment of which there is a freedom of expression no fear of criticism, appropriate feedback. That's the other thing that I notice is missing that I strive valiantly to do is students providing other students meaningful feedback. Because students are used to what? Feedback from the teacher. It's one way. When you, you know, it kind of goes into the whole digital citizenship thing. And, and, and the other thing I used to tell the students also and it was something when I played football that one of my, um, my teammates who I really looked up to uh, would tell me is that when you're out on the field, you know the booze? Yeah, those are from the cheap seats. Those are the people that aren't willing to go down on that field. And you'll see I have a quote that I, it's actually an animated thing I'll share with all of you. That's where that's coming from. So what I would tell my students is, you know what happens when you, get a, you see a blog and you see negative comments? Chances are that person doesn't have a blog. Okay? And that's what happened. And speaking of which, to show your work, 
because I wanted to make sure that I was completely transparent with all of you, guess what I'm guilty of not doing? Showing my work. That is my website, and what you see there are 13 drafts of blog postings that I have not published. Why? A little bit of fear. A little bit. I used to post on a blog, I stop, and I have all these ideas. I'm like, oh, let me capture the ideas. And I don't know if I want to post them yet. It's changing after today, though. And part of it is because I reread Show Your Work. And part of, the, part of what stuck into my head after rereading that was a lot of what's in that book was because he was posting things on Twitter. And he's like, you know what? I'm just going to put everything on there. The whole process, the feedback that I get that's constructive, meaningful, learning, that's what I'm going to use. Me, I need to do the same thing. That's where showing your work comes in and why it's important. And so ultimately, I share this quote because this is another example of why it's important for us to utilize technology to have a meaningful PLN, professional learning network, and more importantly, with our students to foster an environment in which there is no fear of failure, there is no apprehension of vulnerability, there is we all are putting ourselves out there, so therefore everyone is vulnerable, therefore everyone will support everyone, and therefore everyone will engage in a meaningful way of providing feedback, and more importantly, the feedback that is a catalyst for learning. All right, and so the other thing, I, the other reason why I say that is that our, my perspective is that our imperfections are a gift. Okay? If we were all the exact same, this is what you would have. And so I'm going to share with all of you a couple of animations um, from Zen Pencils. This is fantastic. I love this. Love the posters he draws and everything else. Here you go. Imperfections. If we're not, if we are all the same, here you go. 11 ways to be unremarkably average. Accepting what people tell you at face value. Not questioning authority. Go to college because you're supposed to, not because you want to learn something. Sit at a desk for 40 hours a week for an average of 10 hours of productive work. And you notice what website he's on, of course. Go overseas once or twice in your life, always to somewhere safe and easy. Get the largest mortgage you qualify for and spend 30 years paying for it. Don't try to learn another language because Everyone else will eventually learn English. Okay? How about think about writing a book but never do it? Think about starting your own business but never do it. Don't stand out or draw attention to yourself, i.e., don't show your work. Jump through hoops to check off boxes, get a lifetime service award, and here's the funny thing about this. See that? Look what the name of that watch is. Not even real. Okay? And there you go. Here lies an unremarkably average man, and here's a quote, you don't have to live your life the way other people expect you to. The gifts of our imperfection is that we are all unremarkably not average, and that our imperfections are our perfections. Okay? And so now, I have another story that I'll go after this. To me, what happens when failure meets innovation? Failure meets innovation, innovation, iteration, innovation. You get something like this. Dyson. Guess how many versions of that first bagless vacuum he made through iteration after iteration after iteration? 5,126. And he specifically says that he looks to hire people who aren't afraid of failure, embrace innovation, and provide a meaningful, constructive environment so that no one is afraid of failure. And I love Dyson documents, by the way. Okay? Yeah, 5,000 versions. Okay? 
persistence, innovation. Failure was not an option. Failure was a component of the process. Okay? And so then now, I will leave you all with a couple of lasting things. So I used to have in my classroom a big poster that this is the starting quote for. And so I will go to that, which is also in Zen pencils, and share it with all of you. So, if I might, may read. It's not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbled, or the doer of deeds could have done better. The credit belongs to the man in the arena whose face is marred by the dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs and comes short again and again, who knows the great enthusiasms, the great devotions, and spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who know neither victory or defeat. Putting yourself out there, making yourself vulnerable, embracing your imperfections, recognizing, embracing, and loving the fact that failure is a part of the learning process, that it is important for growth, that it is important for all of us, for our students. It is a human condition, okay? And so now, with that, I will leave you all by encouraging all of you to yourselves and encourage your students to go out and fail ambitiously and fail magnificently because in the end, you gotta break a few eggs before you can make a cake. Thank you very much.